Well, friends, an aspiring day one dictator is now a day one defendant as Donald Trump's first criminal trial gets underway. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, my main takeaway from day one of Donald Trump's first criminal trial. So my overarching thought when I woke up this morning as Donald Trump's trial was set to begin was this. Today, we take an important first step toward fulfilling the long dormant American promise that no one is above the law. Yes, we have a long way to go to make that promise a reality, but the fact that a former president of the United States will be tried for his election interference crimes matters. Now, friends, let's briefly start with some of today's reporting, and then I want to take on three developments in court today and try to translate them from legalese to English. But I hope you'll forgive me if we start with a little bit of the atmospherics of today's trial proceedings. This from the New York Times. A weary Trump appears to doze off in courtroom ahead of criminal trial. And that article begins, former President Donald Trump seemed alternately irritated and exhausted Monday morning as his lawyers and prosecutors hashed out pretrial motions before jury selection in his criminal case. Even as a judge was hearing arguments on last minute issues in a criminal case that centers on salacious allegations and threatens to upend his bid for the presidency, Mr. Trump appeared to nod off a few times, his mouth going slack and his head drooping onto his chest. The former president's lead lawyer, Todd Blanche, passed him notes for several minutes before Mr. Trump appeared to jolt awake and notice them. At other times, Mr. Trump whispered and exchanged notes with Mr. Blanche. He sat motionless while his own words from the infamous Access Hollywood tape, on which he bragged about grabbing women's genitals, were read from a transcript by a prosecutor. At times, Mr. Trump's emotions were characteristically on display. He smirked and scoffed and appeared frustrated when the judge in the case, Juan Mershon, did not immediately agree that he could miss court to attend the graduation of his youngest son, Barron. But when Justice Mershon warned that Mr. Trump could be ejected or thrown in jail if he disrupts the proceedings, the former president indicated that he understood. The only time Mr. Trump showed a flash of humor was when he laughed at one of his own social media posts, which attacked former fixer Michael Cohen, who is expected to be the prosecution's central witness. You know, Donald, you're kind of fighting for your freedom here. Seems like the least you could do is stay awake. You know, friend, old drowsy defendant Donald, his influence really is waning, and that could actually be seen even before court started today. Remember how a few days ago, Donald Trump sent out a command to his loyal troops, his foot soldiers? He said, on Monday, all hell will break loose in Manhattan. Do you understand? You get what I'm telling you to do? All hell will break loose on Monday in Manhattan outside that courtroom. I mean, that wasn't an observation. It wasn't a rumination. It wasn't a warning. It was a command. It was a directive, just like stand back and stand by and fight like hell or, or you won't have a country anymore. Now march to the Capitol and stop the certification. Stop the steal. 
There will be a bloodbath if I'm not elected, right? And today, the command he sent out regarding what his troops should do today, Monday, all hell will break loose. You understand what I'm telling you? And look at what it looked like outside the courtroom this morning before court started. Kind of looks more like all accountability was breaking loose. And that carried into the courtroom. You know, I don't know that I've ever seen a defense team lose so much, lose so consistently. And the losing continued this morning in court ruling after court ruling before they brought the jury in. There were some motions that had to be cleaned up, that had to be ruled on. <laughs> Donald Trump um, wanted to keep Michael Cohen off the stand. No, Michael Cohen will be testifying. Donald Trump said Stormy Daniels can't testify. Stormy Daniels will be testifying. Well, not Karen McDougal. Yes, she will be testifying. Even the one thing that seemed like a win, right? Trump's lawyers argued the jury shouldn't get to see the Access Hollywood tape. You know the one, because they said it would be so wildly prejudicial because they would see Donald Trump actually talking about who he really is and what he really does, and it's not really relevant to the hush money payments. The judge had ruled that, okay, I'm not going to let the jury see the Access Hollywood tape. Sounds like a win for the defense, right? Well, today, the judge ruled that an email containing Donald Trump's statement in its entirety from the Access Hollywood tape is admissible. So the jurors may not get to see Donald Trump announcing what he does to women because he's a star and they let him do it, but they will read it and they will see what Donald Trump says he does to women. So even that was a loss. Okay, friends, now let's take on three of the developments that unfolded in court this morning, actually before the jurors were brought into the courtroom after the lunch break. Um, the first one is what's called the Parker warnings. What are the Parker warnings? Well, every jurisdiction has its own name for certain legal principles or procedures, and usually that name comes from the case in which the appellate court decided uh, a certain legal issue that then became kind of part of the ordinary procedure in a criminal case. Let me give you a perfect example. You all know the Miranda warnings, right? You have a right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have a right to an attorney. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed to you free of charge, etc. Why do we call those the Miranda warnings? Because the case in which the Supreme Court decided that those warnings are required um, involved a defendant named Miranda. So they are forever known as the Miranda warnings. And in New York State Court, one of the warnings that a judge gives the defendant is referred to as the Parker warnings. So this is what Judge Mershon told Donald Trump, warned him of, put Donald Trump on notice of today. You have the right to be present during the trial and to assist your attorneys. Do you understand, Trump? Yes, Judge Mershon. If you disrupt the proceedings, you can be excluded from the courtroom and committed to jail based on your conduct, and the trial will continue on in your absence. Do you understand, Trump? Uh, I do. Judge Mershon, if you do not show up, there will be an arrest. Do you understand, Trump? I do. So... Defendant Donald was given his Parker warnings. But, I mean, what are the chances he'll act up and disrupt the proceedings? Another development. At one point, Donald Trump was getting up and walking up to the bench while his lawyers and the prosecutors were having a discussion with the judge. And I had some people ask, wait, is that usual? Does the defendant get to walk up to the bench and participate and listen to what's going on up there? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Why? Because a defendant has a right to be present at and privy to 
every hearing in his case. Let me tell you how we do it in the courts of D.C. Ordinarily, when the prosecutor and the defense attorney go up to the bench, because there's something that's going to be discussed, not exactly privately, but such that the audience can't hear it, or if there's a jury in the box, the jury can't hear it. They may be discussing a legal issue that the jury should not be privy to. What we do in D.C. is the defendant has a pair of headphones at counsel table, and he or she will put them on, and they can hear what is uh, being discussed at the bench. The judge's mic is broadcast just to the defendant's headphones, so he or she can listen in on what's going on because the defendant has a right to be present at and privy to everything that goes on in his case. Some jurisdictions have the defendant come up to the bench um, rather than use the earphones as I've just described. So it's not at all unusual for a defendant to be up at the bench if that's the way that that jurisdiction handles it so that he or she can hear everything going on in their criminal case. They shouldn't be excluded from anything that's being discussed or anything that's being decided. Let me take on a third issue, a third development today. Contempt of court for violating the gag order. You may have seen some reporting on this, but Donald Trump has been violating Judge Mershon's gag order early and often, posting things about the witnesses, calling Michael Cohen all sorts of horrible names, you know, um, laying into Stormy Daniels, calling her all sorts of nasty names. And he has also commented about Judge Mershon's daughter since Judge Mershon put the gag order in place, prohibiting him from talking about the judge's family members. So the prosecutors appropriately said, um, Judge, we think we have at this point at least three violations of the gag order, and we'd like to take that up. And Judge Mershon decided that he would take it up, but not until next Wednesday. <sighs> Courts in session in this trial on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. Wednesday is the down day. That will typically be the day when the parties, the prosecutor and the defense regroup, maybe prepare witnesses who are going to testify in the upcoming days and weeks. And I can tell you anytime, we usually had Fridays off from trial in D.C. and we would pack a whole lot of pretrial prep into that Friday. So the prosecutor said, we want you to hold a hearing and we want you to hold Donald Trump in contempt for violating the gag order. Judge Mershon said, okay, why don't we do it not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday? And then the prosecution actually said, well, Judge, can we actually do it the next Thursday morning at 9.30 before trial starts? And I suspect that's because the prosecutors probably had a whole bunch of work already packed in to that Wednesday, and the judge said, said he would accommodate that. So we're going to have a hearing on the violation of the gag order. We're going to have a hearing on Donald Trump's contempt of court, um, 9.30 in the morning on Thursday. I believe it's April 23rd. So a couple of observations about that. First of all, I think it's unfortunate that it's going to wait that long. Because in the meantime, will Donald Trump continue to endanger the witnesses by violating the gag order and talking about the witnesses, put them in harm's way? because, you know, Donald Trump continues to send out his missives about what horrible people, really anybody who is engaged in the endeavor of trying to hold him accountable for his crimes, what horrible people they all are, with the subtext of everything Donald Trump posts and says, get him, get him, you know what to do. So I think it's unfortunate that the gag order or the violation of it won't be taken up until April 23rd. Um, another observation about why it's not being taken up immediately, and there actually is a reason it wasn't decided today by Judge Mershon. I wish he had said we will do it this Wednesday, which is the earliest moment when I think they could have taken it up, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, so under New York state law, if somebody is arguably in contempt of a court order, like a gag order, if the contempt happens in the presence of the judge, in other words, if the defend, defendant does something in court that is a violation of a court order, then the judge can instantly hold that person in contempt and sanction them. However, 
if the alleged violation of the court order is not in the judge's actual presence, then the defendant under New York state law is entitled to notice of the violation and a hearing on the matter. So today it was the prosecution putting the defense on notice that they will pursue a contempt, uh, a violation of the judge's gag order. They will ask the judge to hold Donald Trump in contempt and sanction him. But today they gave him notice. I wish they would have taken this up this coming Wednesday, but it will be the following Thursday. And I think that's unfortunate. And I think that undermines um, the, the danger that Donald Trump poses by his continued violation of the court's gag order. Here's the other thing you probably want to know. What is the sanction? What's the penalty for contempt? Well, under New York state law, um, each time you violate a court order, each time you're found in contempt, you can be fined up to $1,000. I know that means nothing to Donald Trump. More importantly, you can be jailed for up to 30 days. That will probably get Donald Trump's attention. Right now, the prosecution is alleging there are at least three times Donald Trump violated the gag order. That could be up to 90 days in jail. So will Judge Mershon have the appetite to impose a sanction that includes some time in jail? I don't know. I hope so, because at some point, the rule of law should rise up and be applied to Donald Trump the way it would be applied to any other person in the criminal justice system. But I'm not wildly optimistic that, you know, Judge Mershon will leap right to that sanction of putting Donald Trump in jail. Here's what judges like to do in my experience, and I dealt with lots of contempt situations when somebody was, for example, on pretrial release and they violated a court order, a condition of release, or when they were on probation after their sentence to incarceration and they violated court orders, conditions on their release, their probation. Judges ordinarily do this incrementally. The first violation, they will ordinarily give the defendant a stern warning and put him or her on notice. Do it again, there will be a sanction. When the defendant does it again, there will be a sanction, but it's usually a low-level sanction. That's where I think the $1,000 fine would come in. And when that second violation occurs and a judge imposes a sanction, for example, a $1,000 fine, here's what judges will often say. You've had two strikes. I'm imposing a sanction, a fine. Do it again. You're going to jail. Do it again. You're going to be looking at that 30 days in a jail cell. Do you understand, Defendant Trump? That is how I suspect this might play out. And friends, I think we're going to stop there for today. Not surprisingly, I will be doing Justice Matters videos covering this trial all day, every day, and I'll try to tackle um, the most important developments in court each day. Tomorrow, for example, I want to circle back to jury selection because you may have heard that today they called for 96 jurors. And when the judge asked who thinks they can't sit fairly as a juror in this case, 50 hands went up. And those 50 jurors were summarily excused. That's unusual, but I don't think it's a bad thing. And tomorrow, I really want to dig into why that is, why it is a departure from the way jurors are ordinarily selected, and why it's probably the right approach by Judge Mershon in this case. But as I say, I'll be doing Daily Justice Matters videos here on my YouTube channel. Can I humbly ask you to subscribe? Hit subscribe. It's always free. It doesn't cost anything. I will also be doing daily videos with my partner, Brian Tyler Cohen. He and I are in a partnership called The Legal Breakdown. And we will be doing daily videos analyzing what's going on in court. So if you're not already subscribed to Brian Tyler Cohen's YouTube channel, um, can I humbly ask you to also subscribe to his channel? So it's channel. I'll be doing double duty. I'll be doing my videos here on Justice Matters. I'll be doing the legal breakdown with Brian Tyler Cohen. And of course, I'll be popping up on MSNBC with legal analysis. Um, it could be early morning show, midday show, late night show. 
Um, but I will try to post over on some of the other platforms when I'll be appearing on MSNBC. Thank you for bearing with me um, through today's Justice Matters video. I want to end where I started. This is an historic day for our nation because it really is at least a first step on the road to fulfilling an American promise that we've all been told. But I think um, that promise has been broken more than it's been honored. But this is a big step forward on fulfilling the promise that no one is above the law, that the laws will be applied equally, and that justice matters. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.